so I would like to invite my esteemed panelists. I'll just invite them one by one. Winnie will help bring them on stage. We have Betty Murungi who's coming up and we can applaud them as they come on stage. Thank you, you can take your seat next to me. Then we have Honorable Rachel Shebesh who is also joining us on stage. We then have Honorable Naisula Lesuda, who's also going to be one of our panelists. Yes. And our fourth panelist is Bina Maseno. Can we have Bina come on stage? She's all the way at the back of the room, but she'll join us shortly. I've been told 20 minutes. Yes, sir. It'll be a nice conversation. Um, Bina is joining us. Maybe we can just get some initial reflections as Bina takes her seat. And um, we'll just do a first round of what's, what's on your heart, what's on your mind. There's so many subject matters that we can get into, especially based on your speciality. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Honorable Shebesh, then we'll go to Lasuda, then go to uh, Betty Murungi, then Bina. What is it? What's the first thing that comes to mind that you want to share just about your thoughts on women and leadership and movements? Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, today, of course, I want to celebrate Millie and what I believe Millie stands for and my relationship with Millie. And so my reflection today when I was coming was, of course, to speak about the women's movement. Everybody knows me for fighting for the women's movement, fighting for women leadership, believing in women leadership. And as I was reflecting, I was saying to myself, Maybe 10 women or so during the Kano regime fought for the opening of the space for women. There could have been maybe just 10 women. During our time, we, I think we were maybe 40 or so who fought for this new constitution that brought the two-thirds gender rule, brought the 47 women seats. But look at us now, sitting in a room that has more powerful women than men. Look at us having seven women elected as governors. Look at us having women senators, and I'm sorry, I forget the number. Three women elected as senators. Places where we did not even think we would reach. In fact, I thought by now maybe women governors would be at three, four. But seven, seven means we have done something as the women's movement. And as I sit here, I look at many people who taught me as I was coming up. I am a good learner. I absorb learning a lot. And one of the people who used to teach me is sitting right next to me. I'm privileged to be on the same you know, platform with you. But my challenge is to the women leadership. Where is the fire that we had? Where is the drive that brought the results we are seeing today? And when Millie approached me, the first thing I told her is, Millie, we met at uh, Naisula's baby's birthday, and we sat with some members of parliament who I don't know because I'm not in parliament, but I was excited to meet them for the first time. And I asked them the question. I don't know what kind of administration we are having right now, I don't know what happens in Parliament because I am not there. And I don't even know the challenges that they are facing on the ground as women leaders. But how is it that you are comfortable when all cabinet secretaries were named and are in office now and working and we don't have a cabinet secretary for gender? If you know the pain for us to even get that gender cabinet secretary slot, just as the pain of getting the 47 women seats and the two-thirds gender rule entrenched in the Constitution. I want to challenge you, women leaders who are here. I think we have the top of the top. I always we mention women who came before us. The likes of Phoebe Asio, Niva Mwendwa, Chayu Tingilu, Martha Karua, women who opened up the doors for us. I am asking, where are we in the space for growing women leadership. I've been hearing about the G7, the G7. The first time I heard about it, I was very excited. Because I knew 
that G7 will grow women leaders. I believe that that is where the mentorship right from MCS to the top. Because as Milia said in her book, if you are waiting for party, party honchos, who are primarily men, to get women to the top, then you are mistaken. Lastly, I know there is a lot of talk about where women should be. Where is the next level of women we should be? I do not believe that in 2027, we should have an election without a female candidate for president. And I'm asking you women in this room, and the young women who have taken up the role of speaking for the nation. You know, when you see Gen Z, young women, young men speaking for the nation, it means that there is a bit of a gap somewhere. And there is a synergy that can be created. I believe the women's voices are the voices okay. of the masses. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll come around and make sure we ask your final question just to be in time. You've mentioned some critical points. Um, Honorable Laisud, I think, will come to you as well. Um, even if you've picked up anything that Honorable Shabesh has said about women and the role and the opportunity that we have, what's weighing on your mind when it comes to women leadership? And we are also finally joined by a student leader who is going to tell us a bit about herself and give us an interesting perspective. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. Please proceed. Thank you, Janet. Good evening, everyone. You all look so nice. When I look at you from here, you look very nice with your taquis. Is it taquis? You all look very nice. That's a joke that only Wanga understands. <laughs> so anyway, uh, congratulations, my friend and senior, Honorable Mili, Mabona, Odiambo, Atieno, in no particular order. I am so proud of you and what you have been able to do. And uh, today we saw her getting emotional when the book was being read. And we were telling her, which Honorable Shebesh, that she's so courageous to tell her story as it is. Because those stories have to be told. And so top of my mind today when I was coming here, I was just thinking that women, we have to tell our stories. And we have to tell them to inspire, we have to tell them to encourage, we have to tell those stories for generations that will come. I also want to say this, top of my mind when I think about Honorable Mili, growing up and before I joined politics, I used to look at Mili and Shebesh when they were nominated. I used to just admire them and think they are very crazy. Because they, are, they were so courageous in Parliament, they, in what they believed in, in what they stood for, I just used to admire them. And one thing that I take home is that people always assume nominations or the spaces that were fought for are just tokenism. But when you look at Millie today, she's, from, she's come from being nominated. Honorable Shebesh here was first nominated. Personally, I was first nominated to later go to be elected twice in Samburu West constituency. And daring to join the G7. And so as women, we should not allow the thought that women, when you're nominated, it is tokenism. Actually, we've all gone through a process of nomination. Each woman here who's been nominated has a story. It wasn't easy because the political honchos were here. We have uh, Honorable Elachi. She was first nominated. We have very many women who have been nominated. And so, when I joined, I also thought I wanted to be Mili or Shebesh when I came to Parliament. Then I wondered, where do I start? And I just want to share the relationship with my story and even other young aspiring women leaders. You don't have to be Mili. You don't have to be Shebesh. You don't have to be Governor Anne. You don't have to be Honorable Martha um, Karua. Just be yourself. Because when I joined Parliament, I was so lost. People were saying, Naisula, you're so quiet. Will you make it? First, I was wondering, I want to be like them. Can I have that hair first? I'm wondering, where do, where, how do I even start? 
can, can I even shout in Bunga? You know, Mili used to confuse us. One minute she's so nice, she's just seated there nicely, she's saying hi to you. She just walks out. When she comes back in, she's on top of her chair. I'm like, Mili, you know? So I said, I can't be her, but I can create my own space as a member of parliament and do it so well. And so I want to encourage my sisters and colleagues and even those other young women, let us learn the lessons from the women that have gone before us, but just be yourself and give the best to the nation. Right, just be yourself. And in a moment, we'll come to Betty to talk about some of the resistance that I think you can all relate to. But first, I want to cross over to Bina, who kind of stands in this corridor of someone who can transition to power. You've, done, you've participated previously. You now are very passionate about platforming women in politics. Um, what are your thoughts? What's on your mind? Much like Honorable Shebesh and Naisula Lesud have said, what's on your mind with regards to how you're centered and grounded tonight in why we're here? Uh, thank you uh, very much. Please help me appreciate Bomili Mabona once more. Uh, I'm honored and also just grateful to stand on the shoulders uh, of great giants uh, in this country. So as um, I'm listening to uh, both Honorable uh, Shabesh and um, Honorable Laisuda, I think when Honorable Shabesh asks where is the vigor uh, when it comes to the women movement, I am asking where are the young women in political spaces? Um, I am asking why don't we have staying power for especially younger women and um, the role of um, intergenerational mentorship and calling. That is what I am reflecting on as, um, as I'm seated here. And also um, spaces like this inspiring more and more women to run for political office. And I'm saying that because in 2022, we had 16,100 candidates on the ballot. That's from the presidency to the member of county assembly, whichever party you are buying in, whether independent or within the political parties. And from that number, we only had less than 2,000 women on the ballot because we had 1,962. So even as we push for the two-thirds gender rule, you can imagine there's no way we would have achieved it because we didn't even have 50% of the women on the ballot in the last general election, that is 2022. So 14,000 men on the ballot vis-a-vis -vis 2,000 women. And the bulk of the women in this uh, room today are part of the 2,000. But then even when I ask where are the young women, is the fact, is, it's the fact that we only had 14 young women elected as MCAs in this country where we have 1,450 seats. Um, so I see a big opportunity when, when it comes to how we are journeying together and how we are moving away from uh, intergenerational dialogue to intergenerational co-leadership. How are we going to lead together? Because there'll, there'll never be a time where even the senior politicians say, you know what, I think we've been leading for so long, let's all exit and have the young people just occupy the spaces. There'll never be that time. But then there is an opportunity to see how do we lead together? And I think also um, what concerns me as well is how when also women in politics, once they exit office, they fizzle out. While well, men don't fizzle out, as much as women fizzle out. And uh, days uh, like this is a reminder of the work that we still need to do to ensure that women occupy political offices effectively. Thanks. That's a lot of really interesting and important points to reflect on, you know, whether it means transitioning out, still remaining powerful in the seat. Um, and we'll also ask our student representative to talk a little bit more about that co-leadership. But first, I'll come to you, Betty. Um, there's been a lot of mentions here um, around just what it is to show up as a woman leader, being yourself. Um, Honorable Shabesh saying, finding your fire. Bina reflecting on what is keeping us from kind of getting to that next level. How can you reflect on the resistance, the patriarchy, and some of the other issues that perhaps everyone here can resonate with? Mm, thank you, Janet. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first, congratulations, Millie, on the launch of your book. 
Uh, we've been waiting for it. Those of us who are her friends have been waiting to read this book. Uh, now, you asked the question about resistance and patriarchy. Now, leaders, there are leaders in this room, and Millie is one of them, who have exemplified the feminist uh, theory of the personal is political. They understand what that means. That understanding the struggles of women's inequality, the struggles uh, for women's leadership, one has to come from a place where you understand that your personal circumstances are also political circumstances are also the political reality. And leaders like Millie and Martha before her and Charity Ngilu before her and this excellent leader sitting here, the governors and the members of parliament, many of them know and have refused to be put in that uh, particular uh, um, place where it's, you know, they are supposed to discuss women's issues. They are saying we are going to discuss all the issues, all the personal issues uh, uh, pertaining to women's health, women's sexuality, uh, child care, childbearing, all of those issues that make particularly male uh, political figures feel uncomfortable. They have brought it to the core. So the personal has always been political. Now, uh, you asked about where the, uh, the leaders are getting the fire from. Many of these leaders were born with fire in their belly. I met Millie when she was a young, um, young woman, um, straight, I think, straight out of college. And she came to interview for a job at FIDA Kenya, where I was sitting on the board. I think Martha Karua was uh, also on the board, and many of these other uh, legal luminaries were... Uh, in FIDA and sitting on the board. And the young woman came there with so much fire, we were like, what? Uh, <laughs> where did she come from? And she was an advocacy officer, and those were the, the heady days, I think, that you remember uh, when um, the entire FIDA Kenya board uh, was sued, uh, sued a minister in the government who had decided that it was a good idea to uh, have sex on his red carpet in his office uh, with a 13-year-old. You can see her saying, yes, yes, because they were drafting the papers. And the entire board, uh, we had to put a name uh, to the lawsuit because at that time we didn't have the new constitution where you could bring uh, a public interest case on behalf of anybody. So we sued this minister, a very powerful minister, uh, shock on us, the 13-year-old the, the that we were suing on, uh, on her behalf uh, eventually uh, was prevailed upon by her mother, again, patriarchy, and she abandoned the, the lawsuit, so we were left with a bill uh, that then the minister then went back and sued us to recover fees. So that's the kind, that is the young woman, Millie, uh, who was working with us to ensure that we were doing those things 30 years ago. And, 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 and so in terms of um, uh, ensuring that uh, you're not just saying, oh, we are women leaders, uh, we want to be elected, and so on, but that you actually want to bring structural change to institutions, to governance, uh, to even to society. And I think that's what many of you have done in terms of the laws that you're bringing to Parliament. And certainly Millie has done that uh, in the legislation she has sponsored in the Parliament. Thank you for reflecting. Yeah, I think there's so much to glean from what our panel is saying. And hopefully somebody in this room who has aspirations or just a hope to occupy a certain seat or place or platform, this here in this room has so much wealth of experience, knowledge, and hunger. I'm going to come around and ask a final set of questions um, because I know this is the kind of conversation that needs an entire sort of like session on its own. Um, our dear colleague, if you could just introduce yourself and speak to, loosely based on what Bina said, how can we co-lead 
intergenerationally? How can that happen? What do we need to do to strengthen intergenerational leadership? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hona Rebosang Linda. I'm a, I'm a student at the Strathbone Law School. And as you can see, as I stand here, I'm the youngest. I'm 18 years of age, wow. but I fought for my position. <laughs> Uh, I'm currently serving as the president of the Strathmore Spanish community. I serve in the presidential senate and all came after I watched the women leaders in leadership. First of all, I would like to recognize Honorable Sabina Shege. I met her and she agreed to mentor me. I know you remember that. And also I would like to recognize uh, Honorable Mili Mabona. Thank you for bringing us to be part of you. I've always been mentored by them. And if you'll allow me, I would like to give my story in two minutes. Yeah, briefly. So uh, I come from Kericho County, uh, a village by the name uh, Londiani, uh, a village by the name Kapteplanga, Londiani Ward. So the way I came to the Strathmore Law School, I again fought for that position. To be there, you don't have to just sit where you are. So uh, there was this day I was watching Honorable Mili uh, talking in the parliament. And at that time I was still 16 years of age. And I said, God, if you've made Mili to be in that position, then who am I not to ever appear where Mili is or any woman, woman politician is? So I decided to work very smart. I dedicated my time to watching uh, Obina show. Obina, mm -hmm. yeah, so I dedicated my time to watching Obina show, getting what uh, the politicians were talking uh, about there, and I decided that I'm going to be a change in my community. Uh, as I speak in my village, uh, there is no lady that is recognized. Like, people are being pushed. They are being pushed and uh, they are told that women, you cannot lead. But then, I come and bring in the the speech of uh, Hussein Barack Obama, and I still believe that, and I always say that, I have a dream that one day we will have a female president in the Republic of Kenya. Whether you will like it or not, women are coming, and they are fighting. And dear leaders, when kindly hold us hands, we need you to be with us. We need you to help us fight for our positions. Like, at times we are told that we are not supposed to speak being ladies, but do you agree to hold us hands? Female leaders, do you agree to hold us hands? Like as you, as you saw, um, when the panel was beginning, uh, like I told you, I fight for my own space. So I saw there is a space there, and it's, it is a space for the student leaders. We are not there. I stood there and I said, that position is for student leaders. Take me there. And that's why I'm here. To represent the young generation, the Gen Z, so that we may fight for our position. We are coming. And in future, we will lead. Yeah. Wow. I'm being briefed about how I need to wind up. And I was like, let's, I'm sure we're going to remember her for a long time to come. We really do need to wind up, unfortunately. But I wanted to allow you um, to leave the room with something. I think you've all spoken so critically on issues of transition, patriarchy, power, being yourself, authenticity, all of which come together to form who we individually are, right? Some people don't have the courage or audacity to dream. She does, others don't. So what do you want to leave the room with? On a night like tonight, when a book like this is being launched in a room of leaders, of women leaders, in a time when the world is also seeing this rise of audacity and agency, which is also being fought. It's, in, it's on the rise, but it's also being fought. What can you leave the room with? Either fellow leaders, colleagues, students, peers. What do you each want to leave the room with, whether it's your body of work, what you think needs to happen, how you think we need to move forward as we wind up? So maybe we'll just go around and ask everybody to just leave the room with something. We can start the way we began the session, Honorable Chebesh. Thank you. I want to leave the room with authenticity. And I'm asking us to be authentic, whether male leaders or female leaders. 
I think the country is yearning for authentic leadership, leadership that is true, that is people-driven, that listens to the people. And therefore, I'm leaving the room and hoping that people will leave the room with something that I believe merely as part, which is authentic leadership. Thank you. So the last couple of weeks and months, I've been struggling with fear, fear. Should I, should I not, should I? And women, we have a lot of that. We second guess our st ourselves so much. I just want to leave you with, please let us overcome the fears that we're going through, either in parliament, in your next step, whether which position you want to go for. Please just go for it. I am so encouraged by, and she even calls herself honorable, Linda. She just saw a space. She took the space. She overcame the fear. Can the women in this room overcome fear? and go for what you really want to go. Because fear is what holds us back. Fear is what makes us not achieve what we really want to be and even what God intended you to be. Please overcome the fear and be great women in this country. Um, I think mine will be, um, we have to be intentional about um, solidarity. The journey is not easy. The journey in terms of also expanding the spaces for women in politics should just not be left for women who are interested in running for office, but it should be um, for all of us because we understand why gender equality is important. And even the bulk of the issues we discuss in society, women shoulder the bulk of it. Talk about whether it's gender-based violence, unemployment, unpaid care work, just talk about all that. So you don't have to... Um, have aspirations to run for office to actually care about uh, the women in uh, politics agenda. So I think we have to be intentional about solidarity. Holding space. When you see other women in politics are quiet, they fizzled out, check up on them. Guys go through so much. If people are not showing up, you know, just check up on people. You don't know what they're going through. But I also want to applaud even the young women who are doing so much out here to expand the spaces. I'm part of the um, Wazesha Dada campaign. Um, it has run for office, uh, led by um, the amazing Wilkista Aduma. She's in the room. Uh, it has Nirima Wako from Siasta Place, Shiko Kihika from uh, Tribeless Youth. Uh, we have uh, Stella Nderichu from Dada Power. And we have very, very powerful allies Nafula Wafula. We have Jenny Njuki. So I just want to also applaud the young women also who are putting in the work whether it comes to intergenerational um, conversations, but they're expanding the spaces. And I think we just need to be intentional about all that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. In addition to solidarity, I think we need to celebrate our successes. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that we all stand on the shoulders of giants in the women's movement. And we have seven women governors. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> oh, this is so much better. I was saying that I, we need to celebrate uh, the successes we have registered um, in our democratic struggles in the women's movement. We need to hold each other up. We need to celebrate the women in leadership right now so that as we celebrate and commemorate Beijing plus 30 uh, next year in March, we will be saying that Kenya has an amazing story to tell, while at the same time building upon what the other panelists have said about intergenerational uh, mentorship and intergenerational leadership and co-leadership. I like that. Um, but let's not... Uh, um, uh, ignore the fact that we are actually doing really well in terms uh, of having women leaders um, in, in very significant governance and leadership positions. And then I'll just end by saying the personal is always going to be political. Frame the issues from that lens and then you won't be being put in a corner and being told stop behaving like a woman or be a good girl and that kind of nonsense. So let us just keep in mind that the personal is always political. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think you'd already spoken. Is there one more thing that you want to share 
as we as we wind up okay so thank you janet to sum up i would like to tell you women kindly fight for your position do not allow to do not allow people to molest you for money fight for your own position and let me read this quote by margaret if you want something say ask a man and if you want something done ask a woman and before i go and sit there do not allow me to go and sit there but i would like to sit with the women leaders because <laughs> i want you to bring power into me thank you so much you wanted to say something quickly J janet janet allow me to say this mm -hmm. because it's very important the women who are seated in this room come from different political parties what i've noticed in the past is that the men can differ but still be friends still talk to each other immediately they leave that door of parliament i pray and i hope that the faces we see here across political parties when it comes to women agendas when it comes to other issues we stop putting feelings into politics we put feelings candle and be supporters of each other regardless of political party thank you haven't we gleaned so much from this panel can we appreciate them there's such wealth of experience and knowledge and i completely hear what you spoke about i think you were talking about that imposter syndrome of not feeling like you can but i think everybody here has found their way to be able to everybody has their own individual way so thank you for what you do um, and let's keep holding space for each other. I think that's very critical. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, say, let's invite our incredible panelists to return to their seats as I invite Mr. Brian Weke to take us through.